We are going through this little book, Steps to Christ. And I'm telling you, this is one of the greatest little books ever written outside of the Bible. You can use it as a devotional or you can use it like I do often. I'll pick it up when I'm having a struggle with something and I'll go to the chapter that it's appropriate and I'll read it. And it gets me focused and grounded and mentally and spiritually in the right direction. The series that we're in this summer is called Steps into Sunshine, S-O-N, S-H-I-N-E. But really it's Steps to Christ. We're on our third chapter, and that's the chapter in repentance. And the reality is we could spend an entire series just on repentance. It's a huge subject. And it's one that is, I think, for Christians, difficult to really grasp. So trying to preach a sermon on this in a short notice is hard. And but I believe that God's word is full of so many rich and awesome things to say about this. In the third chapter in this little book on repentance, it starts out with questions. And the question is, how shall a man be just with God? How shall the sinner be made righteous? And then it provides an answer right away. It is only through Christ that we can be brought into harmony with God, with holiness. But how are we to come to Christ? Many are asking the same question as did the multitude on the day of Pentecost. When convicted of sin, they cried out, what shall we do? And the first words out of Peter's mouth was, repent. You've all heard the saying, George Washington was an honest young man, and he said, I cut down that cherry tree. There was a cartoon years ago in a Saturday paper showing little George Washington standing with the ax in his hand before him lying on the ground, the famous cherry tree. He had already made his smug admission that he did, in fact, after all, cut it down because he could not tell a lie. But his father in this cartoon is standing there exasperated saying, all right, so you admit it. You always admit it. The question is, when are you going to stop doing it? The word repentance literally means to turn. It is an activity. It is not a concession. It is sincere regret or remorse to the point that one turns away from the thing that made them regretful and remorseful. But it is even more than that. Because you see, true repentance is not possible for you and I. We could sit here and say, I'm going to repent. That is an impossibility. True repentance has to come from one source. And that is from God. So we're going to try to unpack this whole concept of repentance today. And we're going to use a passage of scripture to do that. But I want to remind you that repentance is a theme that goes throughout the Bible. When, when John the Baptist was preaching in the, in the wilderness, what was the word he started his sermons with? Repent. John did not mean people, for people to be sorry for their sin and then just go back to the life they lived. John meant seek God's forgiveness and then change your life. Repentance is a change of our minds about God and ourselves. We change our mind about God. We come to accept that he is the master in our life when we repent. We change our mind about ourselves. We come to accept that we are responsible for, to God for our past, present, and future, and that we are sinners. This change in our minds leads and should lead to a change in our lifestyle, the way we live our life. 
This walk in life that we're in, it should change it. The direction that we're going as sinners, we should do an about face and go the other direction. Repent. It's a U-turn. There is a small town in a remote part of Labrador, Canada called Wabush. It was for years completely isolated from the rest of civilization, but recently a road was cut through miles of wilderness to reach it. Wabush now has one road leading into it, and thus only one road leading out. If someone were to travel miles of unpaved road to, take, to get to Wabush, then there is only one way out, and that is to turn around and go out the same road. See, here's the problem with you and I today, is that we, by birth, arrived in this town called Sin. And just like Wabush, there's only one way out, and that is a road that was built by God himself. But in order to take that road, you have to turn around. And that's what we call repentance. Open your Bibles, please. And today we're going to use our Bibles. Hope you don't mind. So I want you to have your Bibles out because we're going to use them a lot today. This scripture defines, outlines, gives us a roadmap, a blueprint on what repentance should be in my life and in your life. James chapter 4. In this passage we're going to read, there are seven commands God has. Well, seven. (laughs) Seven commands that God has. I want you to pick them out as as I read through this, okay? James 4, starting verse 7. Listen. Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Ooh, I don't like that. Let your laughter turn to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Did you pick them out? We have submit, resist, draw near, cleanse, Purify, mourn, humble yourself. I believe that this is essential to follow this passage in order for you and I to experience and to to do true repentance. And I want to do that today with you. Do you mind going through these seven things with me today? The very first command that James gives us is submit. And honestly, who likes to submit? Nobody. Yeah. It's not a popular term. But regardless of whether or not you like it or not, the Bible teaches it. So if you claim to walk in obedience to God, do we claim that today? (laughs) If you claim to walk in obedience to God, you must accept it. The Bible talks a lot about submission. It says that children are just supposed to submit to their parents. Employees are supposed to submit to their employers. Angels are supposed, supposed to submit to God. We are supposed to submit to our elders and to each other. And your response to all of these is how you submit to God. Because without first submitting to God, you cannot submit to others. Humanly speaking, we are not submissive by nature. Most people can submit when everything is going in their favor. But it takes a special force, a spiritual focus to submit at all times. There has to be a transition from what I want in my flesh to what God's will is. You see, my flesh only looks at my own will and my own self-interests. Well, if it's good for me, I guess I can go along with that. But when I become spiritually focused, I'm not looking at the person that I'm submitting to, but I'm looking to God. I submit to God through those he has put over me. 
that is hard for me to, to say that because I do not like to submit. If you wonder about that, just talk to my wife. You see, what we do as human beings is we look at the worthiness in our minds of what that person is in order not to determine whether we want to submit. But you see, that kind of thinking is toxic in the context of submission and repentance. I'll give you an illustration. In the military, when a soldier approaches an officer, he salutes that officer. There is no question about the worthiness of that individual and whether or not they deserve a salute. It's about rank. As a soldier, you do not judge the officer, only his rank and or position. An officer stands on the authority that was determined by the military. In the same way, everyone in authority does not stand on their own claims or on their own strength. The ultimate authority is God and we must submit to him. But here's the problem. You see, in this, in this verse that we read in James, we have a problem. There's two identifiers to who you and I are in this passage here in verse 8. We are sinners, number one, and we are double-minded. Romans 3 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do you agree with that? Would you sit here today and say, yes, I am a sinner in need of a Savior? All right. Now, we don't like to hear that. In the world, if you tell them they're sinners, you know, we don't, we, we have a real PC issue in our culture today that you can't say anything derogatory or bad or you can't be critical or, I mean, you're shout down, Right. As Christians, we, we don't mind putting that label on ourselves. Hey, we're sinners. We know that. But people don't like to hear that. People don't like the negative. But you see, here's the thing. You can't issue a cure unless you know what the diagnosis is. The diagnosis is you and I are sinners. You can't get chemotherapy unless you're told you have cancer first. You have to hear the bad news in order to get the treatment. We are also double-minded. The word literally means two-souled. S-O-U-L-E-D. In essence, we have a split personality. I'm never quite sure where I'm going. I can't be dependent upon. I'm divided between my allegiance to God and my allegiance to myself. Can't decide what I want more. Do I want God in my life? Or do I want to make my own decisions? Thank you very much. You know what a double-minded husband is? It's a husband that has a wife and a mistress, and he can't decide which one he likes best, so he's going to just keep both of them. Would you like to be married to a person like that? You remember the old song, torn between two lovers, feeling like a fool? Nobody knows? Come on, you remember that song, come on. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> That's all I know. <laughs> if you think you can have God's way sometimes and your way sometimes, not only will you feel like a fool, but you are a fool. That's God's description of us. We are sinners and we are double-minded. Am I willing to submit to that description? Am I willing to submit to his diagnosis, if you will? If I'm willing to submit to his diagnosis, then that's gonna help me willing to submit to his prescription. If I accept God's description of who I am, then I'm gonna follow what his prescription is. And what is his prescription? That is we live in obedience to the will of God. When Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, his prayer was what? Not my will, Lord, but your will. 
The second command in our passage today is resist the devil. Now, I've said this uh, in a sermon up here before, but imagine Satan, if you will, or Lucifer in heaven. And he has just realized, you know, I'm a pretty awesome angel. I'm right there at the very top of all angels. And I think I deserve some worship. Now, the moment that that took place in Lucifer's heart, how many years, centuries, millennia did it take for him to finally get booted out of heaven? How long was that time period that he was able to convince a third of the angels that lived in the very presence of God to say, God, you're unfair. I don't want to be around you anymore. We don't know. But it was a long time, I'm guessing, that, that Lucifer had to develop this craft of deception. We are told in the Bible that angels have more power than we as human beings. Now, Satan was at one point the top angel. How do you suppose you and I are going to resist him on our own? Think about that for a second. There is only one way and there's only one place that you and I have a, any chance to resist the devil. And that is only in and through Jesus Christ. Turn to 1 Peter 5. Don't take my word for it. 8. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Verse 9, but resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Verse 10, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself protect Confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Ephesians 6. Turn to Ephesians 6. Starting in verse 10. You're all familiar with this. The armor of God. You and I have no hope to resist the devil unless we do this in our daily life. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of might. Put on the full armor of God so that, he will be able, that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of whom? Of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And we know by example that Jesus in Matthew 4, when he was in the wilderness being tempted by the devil, what was his defense? The sword. The sword. Right here. We cannot resist the devil except by and through Jesus Christ and being in this word. Now, I just want to take a side note here. This wasn't in my sermon notes, but it just came to my mind. Listen, this is something that I've struggled with in my Christian walk a lot. If I don't start my day out with God, if I don't have that, if I don't have that spiritual mindset that I am spending time with Jesus Christ, that I have that focus, that I have surrendered my heart and mind to Jesus that morning, I can't resist him. And I'm telling you, I fail. That's my experience. But when I take that time and I submit to the Lord and I surrender to him, I'm telling you, it makes a difference in my life. The next command, the third command, I believe is key to all of this. Go back to James 4. 
James 4, verse 7 and 8. The next one, verse 8. What is the term there in verse 8? What does it say? Draw near to God. Draw near to God. Here lies the key to our ability into true repentance. Without this vital component, the possibility of true repentance is gone. And I want to illustrate this by a few verses because we need to know that we have not just an invitation, we have a command, but we have a right to draw near to God. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I love to hear those pages turning. Hebrews chapter 10. Hear the language in what Paul, Paul is writing here to the Hebrews. Hear this language when we read this together. Verse 19. Hebrews 10, starting in verse 19. Listen to the words. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holiest of holies by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. Some, some translations say his body is the veil. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What an awesome God that through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus, who became the spiritual veil by which you and I can go from the outside of the holy into the very holiest of holies into the presence of God. You and I as sinners can do that. Not just with trepidation and timidity, but we can go in there with confidence and assurance. Hebrews 4.16 Paul's not done with the Hebrews here. He says it in different ways, and I want to read this. Hebrews 4, 16. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Where is the throne of grace? The throne of grace. In our understanding of the sanctuary, where is the throne of grace? In the holiest of holies. Jesus Christ is our high priest, has gone into the holiest of holies in heaven. The throne of grace is where the very Father sits. In the Old Testament, it was where the Shekinah glory sat on top of the Ark of Covenant. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Jump over to chapter 7, chapter 7, verse 25. Therefore he, who is he? Jesus. Therefore he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And finally, Hebrews 11. Go to Chapter 11, Hebrews 11, verse 6. Hebrews 11, 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he, he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him, those who draw near to him. Drawing near is, a, is not a physical act. And I want to explain what I'm saying here. Drawing near to God it is not building the Tower of Babel to, to accomplish your salvation in your own, own life by yourself. Drawing near isn't necessarily even going to church or walking up here to the altar. Drawing near to God is something that happens in the quietness and in the stillness of the human heart. It is not moving from one place to another. It is, direct, it is the directing of the heart into the very presence of God. 
who is as distant as the holiest of holies in heaven and yet as near as the door of faith into our hearts. Drawing near to God happens on a very personal, intimate level. It happens here in church. It can happen here. But it doesn't necessarily have to happen here. Does that make sense? Jesus is commanding us to come, to draw near, to approach him. And when we do, when we do come near to Jesus, you know what happens? We are compelled into true repentance. Let's go back to James. James 4. The next command, cleanse your hands. Now, there's a verse in Job 17.9 that's a very interesting verse, but it basically says, I'll paraphrase, those who have clean hands are stronger. <laughs> interesting language, isn't it? Now, in my house, whenever uh, there's a jar in the kitchen that cannot be opened, a mayonnaise jar or pickle jar, honey, could you open this jar for me? Okay. And I can usually do pretty well, but if my hands are dirty or greasy, I can't, I can't open the jar. I got to go wash my hands to make sure that they're squeaky clean. You know what squeaky clean is? When you wash your car and it's all clean and you put your finger on the hood, and that's squeaky clean. There's nothing between your finger and that nice clean car. When you wash your hair and it's just squeaky clean, you can feel your hair and it's squeaky clean. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> in a spiritual sense, this is what God is talking about. Cleanse your hands. Let go of the crap in your life. Let go of the garbage that you're hanging on to. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. It makes your hands dirty. I want to be squeaky clean from all the sins in my life. I don't want anything separating me from God. I want to be as close to him as I possibly can. In his soul-searching prayer in Psalms 139, David encapsulates this concept wonderfully. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and leading me into the way of everlasting. We need to be like David and allow God to search us and in essence, empty our sin-filled hands of all that garbage. I want to read a poem that I found in researching the sermon, and I like the poem. I think it fits really well, but listen to it here. Just listen to the words. I'm not very good at poetry, so I'll try, uh, hopefully I'll get this. <laughs> one by one he took them from me, all the things I valued most, till I was empty-handed, Every glittering toy was lost. And I walked earth's highways, grieving in my rags and poverty, until I heard his voice inviting, lift those hands to me. Then I turned my hands towards heaven, and he filled them with a store of his own transcendent riches till they could contain no more. And at last I comprehended with my stupid mind and dull that God cannot pour his riches into hands already full. The next command is to purify your heart. Many times when we read the word pure in the Bible, we think it's about holiness and living a life that is separate from sin completely. And it's true that the application of purity for a Christian is that they live a holy life. But purity doesn't relate to just Christian things. And I'll give you an example. You know, you see on TV a lot today, these commercials to buy gold, buy gold, buy gold. You know, let's beef up your portfolio. And if you really buy pure gold, usually it comes and it has a stamp that says 99.99% .99 pure on it. That, that's when you know you have good stuff, okay? 
As much as possible, it is free from anything that makes it not gold. Likewise, a Christian with a pure heart, as much as possible, you free yourself from anything that is causing an impurity in your life. Jesus said in Matthew 22, 37 and 38, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first great commandment. Now it doesn't say thou shalt love the Lord with some of your heart and some of your soul and part of your mind, does it? It's talking about 99.99% here, (laughs) 100%, all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul. This is the first and great commandment. In Revelation 3, we read about a church that is hot and cold, don't we? What's wrong with that church that's hot and cold? I'm sorry, it's neither hot nor cold, is it? Neither, right? Just wishy-washy. What's wrong with that church? Can't decide. It can't decide what it wants to be. It can't decide if it wants to be 100% here or 100% over here. What's the name of that church for those of you who are prophecy students? Laodicea. Who are we? (laughs) Convicted. They're trying to eat their cake and have it too, aren't they? Don't we do that in our own Christian life? And again, this is hearkening back to Torn between two lovers. I won't sing anymore, I'm sorry. Matthew 6.24. Matthew 6.24 puts it this way. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or we will hold on to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So how do we purify our hearts? Well, the Bible gives us two examples of how that takes place. The first one is found in 1 Peter 1.22. You purify your hearts by obeying the truth. It says this, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. The second way that we're purified is found in Job 23.10, and it's through trying times. But he knows the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Proverbs 17.3 says it a different way. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests my heart. It's a difficult question that people have with God as why he allows sometimes hard times in our lives. At least part of the answer is because God is working on those and he's working on us to purify us. If you're going through a hard time in your life, and I know some of you are, I know some of you are, get on your knees and ask God the purpose for you in this time. That's a hard question to ask. But allow God to work through this hard time to purify your heart. The next command, start crying, (laughs) mourn, weep. How would you like to come to church here every Sabbath and all we did is sit around and cried? Wouldn't be very fun, would it? But I wanna submit to you, maybe we should do some more of that. Maybe we're so callous we can't weep. You watch what's going on in, Paris, in France this week. 80 people killed by a guy with a semi truck driving through a crowd. And we watch that and say, oh, that's too bad. But do you weep? No, because it really doesn't affect you. It's far away. I can tell you who's weeping when he sees that. That's our Father in heaven. It doesn't make sense to see a verse that says to to weep and to cry because Jesus came to give us life and give it more abundantly. You know, uh, in the board meetings, (laughs) uh, for those of you who are in board, you'll 
sometimes see I, I crack a joke or I make it funny or try to lighten it up a little bit <laughs> in board. Um, is that wrong? Am I sinning? We laugh with each other. We make jokes. Sometimes when I'm up here, I'll, I'll make a joke. Is, is that wrong? Am I sinning? Am I disobeying God when he says we need to start weeping? No. James is saying here, what James is talking about here is he's talking to people that think everything is just fine and dandy. Thank you very much. And he's saying, you, you don't know your own condition. You have no idea the peril that you are in. And I'm going to say that to you today. Do you understand the condition that we're in? Do you understand the peril? People say, hey, we're healthy. We're wealthy. We got everything we need. The world's good. Let's go party. Last week, my brother Jay talked about what the condition of the earth was at the time of Noah, and that's the condition of the earth at the time of the end. And everybody in Noah's time says, hey, everything's great. We're wealthy. It never rains. We're just fine. Thanks very much. When you are living a lie, it's easy to pretend that everything's okay. It's only when you face reality that you see how poor and weak you really are. When we are faced with an undeniable fact of our condition, we are sinners, we are double-minded, then we really begin to weep over our own state. Luke 6.25, Jesus addresses a group of people who were acting as if everything was okay. He told them, woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. When you come before God, when you draw near to God and you truly start to see your condition, it brings the heart into submission and we weep. And it's then that you can truly repent. You know, the Bible has many examples of people weeping. Psalms talks about it. Uh, Ezra talks about praying and confessing and weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God. Matthew 24, 37, Jesus was in anguish over the city of Jerusalem. And what did he do? He wept. In Joel 2, 12 through 13, it says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Rent your clothes, or sorry, your heart, and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, and relenting of evil. Let the priests, the Lord ministers, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and do not make thine inheritance a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they among the people say, Where is their God? It is only when you experience in your spiritual life true sorrow can you experience true repentance. The last one is humble yourselves. And this is my least favorite. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. When I humble myself, what does that look like? When you humble yourself before the Lord, what does that look like? My daughter Haley, who... Um, Many of you know, uh, I talked to her this week and she said, Dad, have you ever read the screw, I think it's called the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis? And uh, I said, no, I've never read that. I've read some of his books, but I haven't read that one. She goes, Dad, you really need to read that book. It's really awesome. I love when my kids tell me what I need to do. <laughs> I love it. So I'm going to do that. That's on my list of things that I want to do. But she, talks, she talked in there about she goes, there's, there's a part of the book in there that talked about how we pray. She goes, I, Dad, I never thought about it, but it talks about how important it is to get on your knees in a submissive attitude and pray on your knees with your head bowed. And I've been doing that since I talked to my daughter. Instead of laying in bed in the morning and praying as I often do, I slide out of bed and I get on my knees and I pray. 
It's the it's it's a physical act of humbling yourself before the Lord. And it makes a difference. When you kneel before your father and you allow him to do whatever he wants in your life, when you surrender, you are humbling yourself before the Lord. I heard a sermon this week on my drive to work in the mornings. I listen to podcasts. One of the podcasts I listen to is um, Timothy Keller. He's a pastor in New York City. And uh, I don't honestly don't remember what the sermon was about, but he was talking about um, the concept of uh, in the Bible where like Joseph, when Joseph was confronted by his brothers after his father died and the brothers were now afraid because dad's dead. Now Joseph's really going get, to get us now. And so they come to him and they say, hey, Joseph, dad told us before he died that you're not supposed to do anything to us. Okay. <laughs> it made Joseph sad. And his response to them was, who, who am I, God? I am not in the place of God. What God did was for good, not for bad. Think of the thousands of lives that were saved because the brothers sold Joseph into slavery. Joseph had the big picture. The brothers did not, okay? But he talked about this concept of not being in the place of God. And we do that as Christians. We put ourselves in God's chair. We judge others. Get out of God's chair and humble yourself before the Lord. Get out of his chair. Second Chronicles 34, 17 says that God hears us when we humble ourselves before him. Matthew 23, 12 says God exalts those who humble themselves before him. Luke 18, 14 tells us that God justifies those who humble themselves before him. Psalms 147 tells us that God sustains those who humbles themselves before him. The story is told of a famous rabbi who was walking with some of his disciples when one of them asked, Rabbi, when should man repent? The rabbi calmly replied, you should be sure to repent on the last day of your life. But, protested one of the disciples, we can never be sure which day will be the last day of our life. (laughs) The rabbi smiled and said, well, there's your answer. Repent now. Do not wait, family. Repent now. Do the about face. Submit, resist, draw near, clean your hands, purify your heart, weep, and humble yourself. All of those are aspects of what repentance looks like in the heart of a Christian and a follower of Jesus Christ. I want to end the sermon today by reading from this little book. Because the answer, when the question was asked at the beginning of the chapter, how shall a man be just with God? How shall the sinner be made righteous? The answer was, it is only through Christ that we can be brought into harmony with God. Christ is the source of every right impulse. He is the only one that can implant in the heart enmity against sin. Every desire for truth and purity, every conviction of our own sinfulness is an evidence that he, his spirit is moving upon our hearts. When Satan comes to tell you that you are a great sinner, look up to your Redeemer and talk of his merits. That which will help you is to look to his light. Acknowledge your sin, but tell the enemy that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Finally, the merits of his his sacrifice are sufficient to present to the Father in our behalf. Those to whom he has forgiven most will love him most and will stand nearest to his throne to praise him for his great love and infinite sacrifice. It is when we most fully comprehend the love of God that we best realize the sinfulness of sin. 
when we see the length of the chain that was let down for us, when we understand something of the infinite sacrifice that Christ has made in our behalf, the heart is melted with tenderness and contrition. And my friends, when you're in that place, that's when true repentance takes place in your life. Amen? You bow your heads. Father, today I ask that you give each one of us heart to submit and to resist, to draw near, to wash our hands, to purify our heart, to weep, and to humble ourselves. It is impossible to do any of that without you, Lord. And so today my prayer for each one of us here, Lord, is that we have a close, intimate, personal relationship with you, that you enable in us the ability to do those things, that you make through your Holy Spirit our hearts willing to do those things, that we leave here today in a, in a in a state of mind that wants to repent, that wants to turn around our life. This road that you built between heaven and earth, Lord, we wanna go to heaven. The song, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. Father, I want us to live our lives that way. This world is not our home. We look around the world today and we see tragedy after tragedy after tragedy, Lord, Lord, I pray that our eyes stay focused on you, that we don't get mired in the controversy and the debate and the arguments. Father, give us hearts of repentance today, I pray. As we leave here today, Lord, help our lives to to be an example, to be an encouragement to those around us. I thank you, Jesus, for your love. And I thank you, Lord, too, that you are a God that is in the middle of our pain that you can touch Rita and Rosella's heart today and say, hey, I know the pain you're going through. I lost my son on a cross. I know what it means to be separated from those that I love. And I'm here for you to love you and to walk with you through it. Thank you for being that kind of a God. In your name, amen.